I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Matt Levine, the writer of Money Stuff, a brilliant daily financial newsletter on Bloomberg View. Matt's column discusses current events in corporate finance and markets with an insightful, nuanced lens and a dry wit. As Matt describes in his bio, he writes about the financial industry on the internet and on the Bloomberg terminal, which is sort of like the internet, but oranger. (laughs) If you receive my monthly email, you'll already know that I'm a huge fan of Matt's and that Money Stuff has become my go-to source of business news. Our conversation covers Matt's path to journalism through law school and investment banking, his daily routine, and some of his favorite writing topics, including why everything is securities fraud, stock buybacks, the CDS market, index funds, private markets, quantitative investing, and beating benchmarks. Today's sponsor has in mind a fascinating way of getting your attention on an investment opportunity. Manny Friedman and EJF Capital are so passionate about the future development of the U.S. through qualified opportunity zones that he asked me to find a way to urge people with taxable capital gains to take a closer look at these investments. The government came out with the next round of regulatory clarifications on April 17th, and we now have answers to frequently asked questions that may have prevented investors from diving in previously. EJF has a fund that's investing in a bunch of projects across the country. But Manny's sponsorship isn't about his fund specifically. It's more about getting the word out so this innovative government program can be successful. The incentives for taxable investors in both real estate and new operating businesses in opportunity zones are massive. And if the program scales, it has the potential to transform economic development for the better in a way that may be bigger than any of us can envision. So that's it. Manny's trying to spread the word and get smart folks to pay attention and find investments in opportunity zones. EJF's fund is one possibility, and there are plenty of others too. But please take a look if you haven't already. If you want to learn more, have a listen to my podcast with Manny about the opportunity zones. It's episode number 91. And one last note. You may remember my very different conversation with psychologist Michael Mervosh about the hero's journey. I've attached a replay of that episode on the feed. Start listening right at the 20-minute mark for a discussion of the journey itself in the mountains of West Virginia. If you're intrigued by the hero's journey immersion experience, now is a great time to sign up for this year's men's or women's summer journey. You can find out more at heroesjourneyfoundation.org. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Matt Levine. Matt, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, why don't we just start with your background? I went to law school. I became an M&A lawyer. Did that in like 2005, which is when M&A lawyers all thought they should be investment bankers. And also, I was working all the time. So at some point, someone came to me and offered me a job as an investment banker. And I said, that sounds good. By which I meant, like, I actually, this guy I used to work with called me. He's like, do you want a job at Goldman? And I said, is it better than this job? And he said, it's a little better than this job. And I asked him very specific questions about the hours. And the hours were a little better. I was like, okay, fine, let's do it. So I went to Goldman. I asked a lot of questions about the hours. I didn't really understand what the job was until I got there. It was like structuring equity derivatives and doing convertible bond underwriting, which like, he told me that. I just like, it's impossible to know what that means when you're an M&A lawyer. So I went and did that. And it was a very strange field. Like no one leaves that to do anything else. After I left, years later, recruiters would call me. I was like a journalist. Recruiters would call me and be like, do you want to head up convertible bonds at like some investment bank? Because there's no one who does it. And everyone who does it just keeps doing it and rotating between banks. But it was like a good exposure to a lot of things. I was like pricing derivatives and like thinking about options math and Greeks, but also like your corporate equity derivatives are not really driven by finance. They're driven by taxes and accounting and securities law. So like I was learning a lot of stuff about those fields and I was working with investment bankers and 
hanging around M&A deals and underwritings, but I was also working with traders and sort of seeing how they thought about risk. So it was a good exposure to a lot of different finance things. And I was like good at it early on because it was a lot of structuring and thinking and keeping track of stuff. And then as I got more senior, it became more about selling and I was worse at that. So I eventually got pretty bad at my job and didn't like doing it. And I thought I'd do something else. And so I um, more or less quit to go right at Dealbreaker, which is this financial gossip blog, financial blog. I don't know. How long did you go from being the junior person keeping track of stuff to more senior in a salesy kind of position? I don't know. I started as like a second year associate and I left as like a second, third year VP. It's a mix all the way through. Like the MDs on my desk were like actively involved in structuring stuff and the associates would occasionally pitch deals, you know, but like I would say that as an associate, I was mostly compensated and evaluated for my technical skill and as a VP, I was mostly compensated and evaluated for my sales skill with some crossover. How much total time were you at Goldman? Four years. So now we're on the deal breaker, the gossip. Yeah, it's not really the right word, but I don't know. It's a humorous Wall Street blog. I sort of vaguely thought I could do that, and I didn't really know what I was getting into. But How'd you make that transition? I just sort of did it. So I really didn't want to be a banker anymore. So I went to my boss, and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And this is before I had a job at Dillberg. I was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And he was like, well, what are you going to do? I was like, I don't know. I'm going to quit and like think about it for a while. And he said, well, don't quit now. Just like take some time off and take like a sabbatical and figure out what you want to do, which is very nice of him. And so I went back to my desk. I was like, I'm going to take two months off. And then before I was able to do that, Dealbreaker was hiring. And I sort of knew people there. I had a friend who worked for their Above the Law, which is the law blog there. And so I applied, and I was like a guy coming from Goldman. They knew me. They knew I was like a decent person. And I just tell people their barriers to hiring me were pretty low because like they don't pay that much. And if I was really bad at it, the commenters would be really mean to me, and I would quit in a month, which just sort of had happened before. So they're like, their risk was pretty low, so they just hired me. And then I went back to my boss, and I was like, never mind. I'm actually quitting for a job. And then they were, they were a little nervous that I was going to deal breaker. <laughs> Right. And so what was that experience like? Ah, it was really fun. It was me and Bess Levin, who's like, not exactly the founder, but eminence behind the site. It was like, we joked that it was our art project. It was like extremely hands off and we kind of did what we want and we did what we found funny. At some point we decided that it'd be fun to have dramatic readings of old Teal Breaker posts. And so we hired an actor and like rented a bar and had dramatic okay. readings. Yeah, it was a good completely structureless environment to do what you thought was interesting and fun in a way that you thought was interesting and fun rather than serving anyone else's purpose at all. Did you have both that kind of business lens of what is this as a business and then also the journalistic angle when you started? No, it's a very small company. So you think about things like that in a way you don't at Goldman, you know, at Goldman, yeah, they'll probably, they'll make some money somewhere. Also, I was like selling things at Goldman, but I don't at Bloomberg, right? Like at Bloomberg, I'm not really that worried about like the business. Someone else takes care of the business. Someone else took care of the business at Dealbreaker too, but it was a much smaller company and you sort of like sat in the same room as the person who took care of the business. We had to do a little more thinking about like how the thing was paid for. So the dramatic greeting night, we sold tickets, you know, like we always were thinking about like we could have an events business, but not in any like really structured way. There was a business side who did the business job and I did not do the business job, but you just you're a little closer to it then. How did the transition to Bloomberg come up? You write on the internet, people can read it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's nice. I talked to them about coming there and then they hired me. I want to dive into a bunch of the topics you write about. And before we do that, I'm kind of fascinated about your writing process because you put out so much. In fact, I find it hard sometimes just to keep up with reading what you put every day and you're writing it. What's the structure of your day look like? There's no real structure. Like I wake up and I write in a panic until I'm done. And I send it to an editor and then I send it out. Oh, so you start the day well, it comes out? my day starts at like 5 a.m. I wake up. I have like some stuff collected for that day's money stuff. Sometimes I've written a section. Mostly I've collected links. Sometimes I've written two sections. But, you know, it's mostly like pretty ill-formed. And then I sort of sit down and write it from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. with some time out to get my daughter after school and whatnot. And then around 11 I send it to an editor and then it gets published at noon. And then usually I like go into the office and then from sort of one till five, I like look for other stuff and start writing stuff and have lunch with people and complain to reporters and do all of the job stuff that isn't typing the thing. 
Do you mentioned you start writing at 5 a.m. Do you have a place at your house that you just cordon off and your daughter's asleep and you just roll out of bed and start writing? You know, usually do the crossword first, but like, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a procrastination technique. Oh, well, yeah, you got to wake up. Yeah, no, I just kind of like I have a desk in the other room and I go and sit at it and fire up the internet. And usually the intense writing is starts more than at least half an hour in and I'm mostly checking the news first and waking up. But yeah, it's just like less distracted first thing in the morning. It's easier to focus then. Every day I'm like, I'm going to write more of it in the afternoon so that I don't have to do this. But it's just easier to focus when no one else is awake. Were you that way all through your academic career? No, I'm not like a morning person. <laughs> it's just an accident. It's the series of <laughs> poor decisions. Have you thought about writing a book? Sure. And? I don't know. What should I write? I don't really know. But I've always been amazed at how much you put out every day. I like what I do. Bloomberg is nice to me and it's nice to have a daily audience. It's nice to have people who are kind of reading it every day and like it's just more interactive. It's not easy for me to write every day. It's like exhausting, but it's a frequency that works for me. I think if I just were told you have a year, come back with a book, that would be hard. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I'll do it one day, but like this frequency works for me. What does that interactive feedback look like? People tweet at me. And like I go talk to people in the industry sometimes. And they're like, oh, yeah, I read your column. Oh, what do you think about that? My impression is that a lot of people who work in the financial industry read it. And I can talk to them about what they think. And it's just like a more, you know, like if I wrote a book, the sort of like directness of feedback is missing. How did you come to the structure of this kind of lens of corporate finance from your couple of years at Goldman and then just applying it to what you're seeing in the markets and in companies? I started at Dealbreaker as like a blogger, right? I wasn't like an investigative reporter. I didn't have time to like go spend a month chasing down a story, you know? So like it was very much like reacting to the news. And I always sort of felt like if I'm going to ask people to read what I write rather than someone else, right? So I should bring to bear some expertise or something that I'm not just quoting people are making a joke, but I know something that isn't obvious about the news. So like, that's the basic thing is that sort of old school blogging is it's like someone who has an expertise in something other than journalism, like writing about the news of the day. So it's not like necessarily like reporting or research intensive, but it is applying knowledge to something. I want to start hitting on some of your topics you write about. And so I'll just say it. And why don't you just sort of go, <laughs> <Where does laughs> give you my from? Stick. just go give me your stick. All right. <laughs> Everything is securities fraud. Everything is securities fraud. I feel like this is like the lightning round. What I talk about a lot is, you know, a bad thing happens to a company, shareholders will sue. And often like the SEC or the Justice Department will get involved. But the reason they'll sue is always that bad thing happens at a company, either the company does a bad thing or like a senior executive does a bad thing or sometimes it's just like a bad thing happens to it like computers get hacked and you can always say well this company either did the bad thing or was vulnerable to the bad thing and they knew about that before shareholders did they didn't tell you they didn't say in their prospectuses in their 10ks we're going to get hacked right or like we haven't secured our computers well enough and they're going to get hacked or they didn't tell you you know our ceo is a sexual harasser or like a whole range of bad activities the one I like to quote is SeaWorld. There's a documentary about them abusing orcas, and that became an SEC securities fraud case. They were not sufficiently transparent about this documentary involving their abuse of orcas. So the company knew it. The shareholders didn't know it. The company didn't tell the shareholders. Shareholders were buying and selling stock. They were doing that without complete information, so they were defrauded. There was securities fraud. Or like sometimes people don't like that word, but there was a failure to disclose that is more or less securities fraud. If you think about, if that's your lens on the world, that everything is securities fraud, it's both an opportunity and sort of uncomfortable. It's an opportunity because if you don't like something, it's often a lot easier to go after that thing as securities fraud than as whatever else it is, right? So there are state attorneys general and like people in Congress trying to get the SEC to do it, going after Exxon and other big oil and coal producers for global warming and pollution-related things. And it's like, well, you know, like often they were doing legal but polluting activities, but were they telling you enough about the potential effects of climate change? Arguably, no. And so you can go after them for pollution on a securities fraud theory or like 
rather than having to sort of like prove sexual harassment in a court of law, which can be a fraud process, you can just be like, well, he was fired for sexual harassment, so that's securities fraud. So there's all sorts of things that are easier to do as securities fraud. And so if you don't like some of these substantive bad things, you can punish them as securities fraud. It's a powerful enforcement mechanism. On the other hand, it's very weird because the victim technically is always the shareholders. And so it's very strange to go after ExxonMobil for defrauding its shareholders by drilling for oil. The shareholders wanted that. The shareholders like bought this oil stock so that they could make money from producing oil. And so it's very strange to say, well, those shareholders were defrauded because you were like drilling too much oil and not thinking about the effects of climate change. Like there's a theory for it, but it's just sort of awkward. And it's awkward when you think about like the actual victims of the actual bad things are rarely shareholders, right? They're like the people being harassed or the citizens of the world who are suffering from climate change. And it's philosophically awkward to treat all of that as being about shareholders. It's a weird way to prioritize the legal system around the rights of shareholders, even though it's like not really what's happening, but it's sort of symbolically what's yeah. happening. And then if you take that to the next step, you get to this sort of insider trading. Yeah. Because right? I mean, executives... Right. Everything that's securities fraud is also insider trading. If a bad thing happened and the company didn't disclose it, that's securities fraud. But if like meanwhile the executives were selling stock without disclosing the bad thing, then that's insider trading. Executives are just sort of in the business of selling stock because they get paid a lot in stock and they need to like buy a house and so they'll sell stock. And so if like you have an undisclosed bad thing for long enough, then there are at least going to be accusations of insider trading. And then on the other side, there's a lot of noise these days about buybacks. And I know you have your own spin on the debate. There are some plausible criticisms of buybacks. I feel like I don't want to like take too strong a side in like the buyback debate. But a thing that troubles me is a lot of people, there is a strand of the buyback debate that says companies should never return money to shareholders. It says once money comes into a company, it should stay in that company forever, which is obviously not what anyone says. But it's like sort of the implied position that returning money to shareholders is always bad because companies should always be spending it on some other thing, whether it's employee benefits or lowering costs for customers. But it's often expressed as long-term value. It's expressed as like, you have this money and you should invest it in like building stuff in the business rather than waste it by giving it back to shareholders, which I think is a sort of strange bias to have. And like, if you sort of look at like the long run of how buybacks happened, basically what happened is like the seventies and eighties, there was a view that corporate managers liked to spend money inefficiently and to aggrandize themselves and build empires. And so like, there's this wave of conglomeration where like managers are like, oh, look, we have money. We should buy some more stuff so we can have a bigger headquarters and I can run a bigger company and be more famous. And as a corrective to that, shareholders got more interested in having companies return money to them so that they could decide how to invest it rather than having the companies decide how to invest it. And we've now perhaps swung too far, but also like the rhetoric has swung too far where now it's just assumed that the worst thing companies can do is give money back to shareholders. Now, there are some arguments for that. Like the shareholders are often like the managers own a lot of shares and boost their own compensation and so forth. But the sort of original notion that returning money to shareholders disciplines managers and allows and prevents them from wasting the money is then lost. And we've kind of gone the other way, which I find kind of weird. So we take it away from the pure corporate side and I want to get into the markets a little bit. You've been writing a lot about what's happening in the CDS market. Why don't you start with where the CDS market started, where it is today, and where you think it's going. So CDS is a contract that allows you to bet on the credit quality of a company. CDS is a contract that pays off when a company defaults on its debt, and it pays off basically the amount of money that, theoretically, pays off the amount of money you would have lost on default. So when you think about how that started, you could short bonds, right? You could borrow a bond and sell it short, and then if the company defaulted, the value of that bond would go down and you'd make money, Right. But CDS has some advantages over that. One is that it's like kind of hard to borrow bonds. They're often like it's kind of locked up. Another is that it allows you to make a sort of generic bet on the company rather than picking a specific bond to bet on. So you just have more liquidity because you're there's sort of one CDS contract on the company rather than a bunch of different bonds. Another thing is like there's there's someone on the other side, like someone who wants exposure to the credit of a company but doesn't have the funding to buy the bond can buy the CDS. There are elements that make CDS as a contract a nice way to bet on the credit of a company, but it is different from just the bond. And so what's happened now is that a bunch of people have found ways to 
more or less drive a wedge into that difference to say, instead of just being like a pure bet on outside facts in the world about the credit of a company, you can like do stuff to make that CDS contract pay out in a way that the bond wouldn't have paid out. And these are often talked about as, as like some broad CDS shenanigans, but there's like a bunch of different things. There's no like real coherent single thing that happens. Like one thing that happens is that hedge funds will go to companies and say, hey, if you default on your bonds, like just a little bit, like just don't, don't pay one bond, like maybe one that you own. So you don't even, no one even gets mad at you. If you just like do a default on your bonds, then our CDS will pay out. And so we'll have money because these hedge funds have CDS. So we'll have money and we'll give some of it to you, right? And they don't say it like that because it sounds like a bribe, but they'll be like, we'll give you a beneficial refinancing. We'll refinance your debt at some more favorable rate to you and we'll subsidize that with the payout we get on our CDS. Another thing you can do, by the way, is like, if the company, default, if like Microsoft did that, which they wouldn't, but if they did that, CDS wouldn't pay out very much because their bonds are not distressed and like the CDS pays out basically the amount you would have lost on the bond. But you can go to a company and be like, why don't you issue a really weird bond that would be deliverable into CDS and that would be worth like 10 cents on the dollar so that the CDS mechanism will be tricked into thinking we lost a lot of money on the bond and it'll pay out more and then we'll have more money to give to you. So that's like the refinement of that trade. Another thing is like CDS was kind of more of a thing 10 years ago than it is now in a sense. So there are all these companies that are in this weird position where they have like a lot of CDS but not a lot of bonds in the thing that CDS is on. They have a lot of bonds in some other subsidiary, but the subsidiary that the CDS is on doesn't have a lot of bonds. And that creates weird dynamics for CDS. And so hedge funds will exploit that two ways. Sometimes they will try to minimize the amount of bonds so that the CDS doesn't pay off the ones who are on the who sold CDS will do that. Other times they'll be like, hey, you should issue a lot of bonds in your old devalued subsidiary or just make them co-issuers. And then our CDS will go up way up in value and we'll give you some of that value too. And there's lots of other stuff like this. So it's like become a playground for clever hedge fund people to think about structure rather than this pure bet on credit quality independent of all these things. I'm not that bothered by this for a couple of reasons. One, it's like, Many of these stories result in companies getting cheap financing. And it's like, well, you have this derivatives market. The company didn't ask for it. It just like grew up independently of these companies. And now the company's like, hey, we're going to extract some money from that derivatives market. That's kind of cool. It's like a story of the triumph of regular corporations over Wall Street capitalism. Another reason I'm not that bothered by it is that I think it's a mistake to think that there is this pure bet on the credit quality of a company. A company is going to default or not default, not just based on its cash flows, but based on like whether it can get refinancing or whether its lenders will extend its loans. That's a question that is not purely economic, but depends on its relationship with the lenders. And this is just the sort of expansion of that, where like the creditors are making decisions that are about their own self-interest and not just like a pure objective default decision. So all this stuff, people find it sort of shocking because it feels manipulative. It feels like negotiated and weird and backroomy, but like that's kind of what credit is. So it doesn't bother me that much. But people complain about it a lot. One thing that happens is people, every time one of these things happens, you'll read quotes about how this is going to be the end of the CDS market. And it's not, but at the same time, it does feel like sort of diminished compared to like where it was before the financial crisis. So I think people are very focused on making it a little bit less surprising and there's is the which runs this I just announced the new like a change to the CDS documentation to eliminate one of these surprises so you know they're working on it maybe it'll happen but maybe it'll be some somewhat less surprising but it does just feel like it's all these questions are always going to be kind of fought over and negotiated because that's what happens when a company runs out of money so there's only so much room to improve it Take a step back and talk a little bit about some of the key trends and markets in general. The first being the movement of money into passive vehicles and index funds. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I think there's a really interesting set of corporate governance questions around passive. There's sort of an intuition about what like a, a hedge fund manager, even a mutual fund manager, should do with the companies that he owns. They should make sure that they're making money and like call them up and yell at them if they're doing something wrong and like maybe start an activist campaign or support an activist. There's a whole, like, if you're an investment manager who analyzes companies and picks a relatively small number of them to invest in and monitors them closely, you have, like, a relationship with their governance that makes a kind of intuitive sense. If you're Vanguard and you're, like, the biggest shareholder in a whole bunch of companies, but no one picked them, no one follows their financials, 
it's just weird to think about what you should do there. One thing is you see a lot of the big passive fund managers spend a lot of time saying, we're not passive in governance. We care a lot about governance. We really focus on this. Now, it seems unlikely that that is primarily organized around financial performance, right? So like if you're a activist hedge fund manager, you're mainly interested in like, can the company make some changes that will make it more money? If you're Vanguard, you can't process that question for thousands of companies. You don't have industry analysts for a lot of those in a classic index fund. And so you're thinking about much more general questions like what is the structure of good corporate governance? Should the board be independent? And should the chairman be the same as the CEO? And these like sort of very generic questions, which probably add value, but you tend to get generic answers if you're asking questions about 3,000 companies. And you can only focus on sort of high level governance stuff. You also get a lot more like it's almost more political and social questions. So like Larry Fink of BlackRock sends this letter every year that's like companies should be more good, right? Bill Ackman doesn't say companies should be more good. He's like, this company should like divest this business or whatever, right? There's like a there's like a direct corporate focus. If you're looking at every company at once, you're sort of more interested in broad social issues. And then the thing that I love writing about is if you own all the companies, you might want them to compete less against each other and raise prices so they can extract more money from consumers. This is a theory that some academics espouse and are really into, and that I usually refer to by the tagline, should index funds be illegal? But the theory is that if you're like a concentrated activist shareholder of like a dozen companies, you pick the best company in a couple of industries, and you want that company to be the winner in that industry and to gain market share and to compete as hard as possible. If you own every company in an industry, then you mostly want prices to be high. You don't care about who has the market share. So you'd never want your company to cut prices to gain market share because that would just decrease the size of the pie for everyone. No one I talk to in the financial industry thinks that's true, like zero people. Academics like it, and it has some, it's gotten some attention from regulators, like the FTC has held hearings about it. And it makes like a lot of intuitive sense because like when you say it like that, yeah, it just makes sense. One reason that no one believes it is that there's no evidence that anyone calls up corporate managers and says, hey, you should keep your prices high and not compete. So it's a little hard to figure out what the mechanism would be by which this would work. But what I think is interesting about it is that it speaks to these broader questions of like, how are companies governed when half of their stock, let's say, I mean, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. When half of their stock is owned by like four big index fund firms that just don't make investing decisions. I'm not interested in like the index fund managers calling the CEOs and saying, do illegal stuff. I think as a CEO, like how do you think about your job when your biggest shareholders are, there's no one picked your stock, there's no analyst. Interests are in sort of 30,000 foot questions of governance rather than in like how you're running your business. It's just a weird thing to think about as a corporate CEO. There's been this wave in the last couple of years of the private unicorn obviously more and more money from big institutions going to private equity managers and sitting in the coffers there and, and not seeing those stocks grow in the public markets. How do you think about that lens of looking at mostly public markets, but a little bit on the private side as well? These two things seem related in a somewhat hard to articulate way, right? It seems like the public markets have become more passive more of the sort of investing decisions and like providing capital to companies that are growing is occurring in the private markets while the public markets are for mature companies to kind of harvest profits. And there's probably a feedback loop where as public companies are bigger and more mature and more steady and profitable, it's easier to index because you just get less alpha by picking stocks. And as public markets become more index dominated, it's like, harder to make your case to index funds if you're like a sort of interesting growthy company. So you might be more interested in staying private. And so it probably feeds on itself. There does seem to be independently, like there's a lot of money that is available to private markets. And like, there's probably just a series of economic and technological changes there where like it used to be, if you wanted to raise a lot of money, you had to go to the public markets because that's where the money was. Now there are more billionaires. There are pools of money in like the Middle East and China that are accessible to American companies that didn't used to be. And technologically, it's easier to raise private money. There's been some legal changes that make it a little easier to raise private money too. But like, there's a lot of inconveniences and downsides to being public. And the notion was always always made up for because if you reached a certain size, the only way to do it was to be public. And now that's not really true anymore. So 
there are going to be more just big private companies. That's sort of what I think. I mean, like one thing that's happening is that this year there's a lot of talk about some of the very biggest unicorns going public. So like maybe this notion of a big change is just sort of temporary. And like in three years, all the big tech companies will be public. But I don't know. Well, certainly the way that some of these are going public is completely different than what it used to be. And they're not tapping into the public markets for capital. Yeah, that's true, right? I mean, there's like these direct listings where they just go public. Well, there's Spotify so far, but it just goes public without doing an offering at all. A lot of the ones that do, it's mainly secondary and like it's not for financing purposes. Uber still burns money. Like they'll probably take some money. What's your take on increased computerization and quantitative methods of investing? On the long view, pretty optimistic about the ability. There are people who are like real deep skeptics about driverless cars. And I don't know enough about driverless cars to have a strong view one way or the other. But it sort of seems like, you know, and I just casually consume the news that driverless cars are, have like made big advances and can kind of drive. And like, to me, it's got to be a lot easier to pick stocks than to drive a car for a computer. Computers, like there's a lot of data about stocks and like, I mean, it's harder for a human, sure. Like humans like learn how to drive. But like a lot of like motor skills, and a lot of visual discrimination that is really hard for a computer to do. And if you can do that, like surely you can look at a giant pile of data and be like, this is the data that, you know, just like you can look at a visual field and be like, this is the visual data that means I should stop because I'm going to hit a child, right? You can look at the pile of data and be like, this is the stock data that tells me I should buy this stock because it's going to go up, right? So it just seems like how hard can this be? I think that we're in a world where it's hard for active investment managers to add a lot of alpha in liquidly traded on the run instruments, you know? And part of that is explained by like the dumbest and simplest algorithms, which is like, you can just buy an index fund, right? Or you can then you can buy like the slightly smarter algorithms, like smart beta things that like say, you know, there's one tweak to it to make it a little better performance. And so like, if you're like a mutual fund manager 50 years ago, if you like track the index, it's fine. Now, if you're a mutual fund manager, like the index most of the time beats you, right? Like that's the statistics. Even if you beat the index, what are you doing? Like you're buying value stocks. You can buy a value index, right? Like there's a lot of, and then like you layer on top of that smarter strategies, the room for humans to outperform and like gut instinct driven picking of liquid investments just seems really, really slim. There's other stuff. You can be activist, right? It's harder for a computer to be an activist, harder for a computer to do a lot of like illiquid or private stuff, but the public markets are going to be commoditized by computers, I think. So I think that you, know, you made this transition from investment banking to journalism and the field's related in what you're writing about, but it's quite a different role. And what you're describing has some implications for the number of seats at the table of those kind of traditionally in the investment business. It does. Yeah. There are a lot of businesses that get very technologized and bigger. If you can get a particular kind of beta from a factor ETF, one thing you can do is like fire all the people who are like doing that strategy. But another thing you do is like you build like a team that sells like a more customized portfolio of you can use it as tools or as inputs into a higher value add product, right? And I don't know how that shakes out in the investment management industry. I I think a lot about you know, I was a equity derivatives guy as a banker, right? In the not too distant past, equities are traded by like calling up a bank and dealing with them directly and getting and paying them an eighth to buy and sell shares. And now basically equities are traded by computers, right, for the most part. And so all those people are gone. But what that did was it made it really efficient to trade equities. And so like the equities business at banks is large and has a lot of people and makes a lot of money because it's not like just buying and selling stocks. It's like selling structured equity derivatives where the ability to dynamically hedge them by like tapping a computer and being like, you're gonna buy shares according to this algorithm and it'll be basically free has made it possible to do those derivatives, which are much more profitable than compare and profitability to buying and selling the stocks. So you can imagine something like that in the investment industry where the picking of what stocks to buy in a large cap stock portfolio has just completely outsourced to computers. But there are other value add things that an investment manager does that they can spend more time on because the computerization has made that just commoditized. But there's also just private markets and activism and CDS trickery. Like there's a lot of other things. And maybe that migration is a response to the commoditization of public markets. You know, alongside of that, you see a lot on the allocator side of the world is different ways people try to figure out if a manager is adding value. Right? It used to be you pick stocks and I'm comparing you to the S&P 500. How should people think about what value added really means? 
I don't know. I genuinely don't know. I mean, like, there are statistical methods for discriminating alpha, and there's some room for assumptions there. I mean, I often write that the essential skill of a hedge fund manager is continuing to run a hedge fund. There's some sort of inherent storytelling element to the job where you'll have like a time series of returns and like that's interesting, but what you make of it and what you're able to tell people and what story you can tell about why your process is good and why these returns represent that process is as important as like the actual set of numbers, which is a half-joking thing I say about hedge fund managers, but makes it challenging for allocators, right? I mean, like, if you're an allocator, like, I don't know, you're you're sort of on the opposite side of that. Like, you're thinking of a story for yourself about, like, what is appealing to you. I realize that's not what you want. You want to be, like, <laughs> here's the objective, like, science of just determining it. But to some extent, it's like you're telling yourself a story about, like, why this guy, why his good results are representative and his bad results are anomalous. And the story that is intellectually satisfying to you is, naturally going to get some weight. All right, man, let's turn to some closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I do really nerdy hobbies. I um, do crossword puzzles and puzzle hunts. Do you know what a puzzle hunt is? No. You like walk around New York solving puzzles or like London or whatever. There's a famous one. Guys at Goldman Sachs used to run a midnight madness puzzle hunt where like people went around the city all night solving puzzles. I never got to do that, but I've done the successor, which is run by some hedge fund guys and I do like other puzzle hunts. You know, I do the crossword puzzle. I do Learned League, stuff like that, the nerdy hobbies. What's your biggest pet peeve? I like read the financial news and write about it every day. And there's this constant theme of people who have like bought a sort of self-evidently terrible investment and then it turned out terribly for them. Like It's like this thing that is clearly risky and structured and they like went and were like, I thought this would be good and then they lost all their money. And it's frustrating What I want in the world is for people to be like better warned about that and then get no sympathy once it happens. I think that you should divide the investing universe into like sensible things and ridiculous things. And like you can do ridiculous things and like ridiculous things like most things. Sensible things like index funds, right? You want to do like hedge funds or whole life insurance or whatever you want, like fine. But you're just, the due diligence is on you. And if it doesn't work out, then like you can't complain. Like I think that would be a better system. We're not there yet because people are not just aren't given the right tools to sort of evaluate that. But it's always very annoying. <laughs> what reading do you almost never miss? I have a weird relationship to reading because my job is to read the internet, right? So people are always like, "Oh, what do you read all the time?" I'm like I read everything all the time. Like that's what I do. I read the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and the FT. At the same time, I don't like read them. You know, like I have some sort of consumption production relationship to them that doesn't feel quite like reading the stuff that I actually read like I get poetry magazine I read that every month <laughs> the thing that I read that feels like reading is separate from financial news what teaching from your parents has most stayed with you they were big readers I was reading a book that probably influenced my life more than anything else is just sort of grew up reading all the time all right last one what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life you know, so I was a lawyer and I became an investment banker. And as I said, it was like, because that's what one did at the time, right? And so I had this very sort of like straightforward career path of doing the most obvious prestigious thing. And now I like writing on the internet. The specific thing that I do now is really enjoyable. Not even writing on the internet is the wrong. Like the specific like work functions that I do are really enjoyable. And I think that I spent a lot of my life assuming that there are like these job types and job titles that were like good because like a lot of people wanted them and I didn't analyze what I was actually good at and interested in and that meant that I spent a lot of time doing stuff that I wasn't that good at and wasn't that interested in. Now I like meet a lot of people who are like I want to get into finance and often I meet particularly lawyers who want to get into finance because I did that and they're like I want to get into finance and one thing I say to them is don't get into finance like finance is a giant field and instead of being like, I'm going to pick the first job that I find that is like at a prestigious core of finance. Think about what you're actually interested in functionally. And like, if you really like people in sales, you should do some things. And if you really want like math and like reading documents, you should do another thing. And like, there's like a series of your own interests that you have to prioritize rather than the obvious prestige thing. And that's very hard to know First of all, because like you're bombarded with the prestige thing. But secondly, you you don't know yourself when you're like 22, but it's worth figuring out. 
because it's a lot more fun to do stuff that you're good at than like just the thing you thought you were supposed to do. Great, Matt. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.